Ashley Brock, Nora Roberts' book, Inner Harbor, Chapter 8. It was probably a chance, a chancy step to take, so Phil wondered if it could possibly be illegal. Lording near St. Christopher's Middle School certainly made her feel like some sort of criminal, no matter how firmly she told herself she was doing nothing wrong. She was simply walking on a public street in the middle of the afternoon. It wasn't as though she was stalking Seth or planning to abduct him. She only wanted to talk to him, to see him alone for a little while. She waited until the middle of the week, watching from a careful distance on Monday and Tuesday, to gauge his routine and the timing. Habitatually, she knew, now knew the buses lumbered up to the school several minutes before the doors opened and children began pouring out. Elementary first, then middle, then the high school students. That alone was a lesson in the process of childhood. She mused the compact little bodies and fresh round faces of the elementary school, then the more gangly, somewhat awkward forms of those who hover around puberty, and last, the astonishingly adult and more individual young people who showed out of the high school. It was a study in itself, she decided, from dangling shoelaces and gape toothed smiles to cowlicks and ball jackets to baggy jeans and shiny falls of hair. Children had never been a part of her life or her interests. She had grown up in a world of adults and had been expected to accumulate, to conform. There had been no yellow school buses, no wild rebel yells when bursting out of the school doors in freedom, no lingering in the parking lot with some leather-jacketed bad boy. <laughs> so she observed all these things here like an audience at a play and found a mix of drama and comedy both amusing and informative. When Seth hurried out, bumping bodies with the dark-haired boy she decided was his most usual companion, her pulse quickened. He whipped his ball cap out of his pocket and put it on his head the moment he was through the doors. A ritual, she thought, symbolizing the change of rules. The other boy finished fish in his pocket and pulled out a fishful of bubble gum. In seconds, it was wadded into his mouth. The noise level rose, making it impossible for her to there hear their conversation, but it appealed to be animated and include a great deal of elbow jabbing and shoulder punching. Typical male affection pattern she concluded. They turned their backs on their buses and began to walk down the sidewalk. Moments later, a small boy raced up to them. He bounced, Sibyl noted, and seemed to have a great deal to say to for himself. She waited a moment longer, then casually took a path that would intersect with theirs. Shit, man. The geography test was nothing. A bozo could have aced it. Seth shrugged to dispute the weight of his backpack. The other blue boy blew. An impressive candy pink bubble popped and sucked it in. I don't know what that, what's the big damn deal about knowing all the states and capitals. It's not like I'm going to live in North Dakota. Seth, Seth, hello. So Bill watched him stop. Adjust his train of thought. Focus on, oh yeah, hey. I guess school's done for the day. You heading home? <laughs> the boatyard. There was that little dance on the nap of his neck again. It irritated him. Well, we got work. I'm going that way myself. She tried to smile on the other one. Hi, I'm Sir Bill. I'm Danny. The other boy told her, that's Will. Nice to meet you. We had vegetable soup for lunch. Well, informed everyone got it. And Lisa Harborough threw up all over. And Mr. Jim had to clean it up. And her mom came to get her. And we couldn't write our vocabulary words. He danced around Spill as he relayed the information. And she had an amazingly innocent, wonderful, bright smile that she was helpless to resist. I hope Lisa's feeling better soon. Once when I threw up, I got to stay home and watch TV all day. Me and Danny live over there on Harrow Lane. Where do you live? I'm just visiting. Michael John and Aunt Margie moved to South Carolina, and we got to visit them. They have two dogs and a baby named Mike. Do you have dogs and babies? No, no, I don't. You can get them, he told her. You can go right up to the animal shelter and get a dog. That's what we did. And you can get married and, baby and make a baby so it lives in your stomach. There's nothing to it. Jeez, Will. Seth rolled his eyes. I spill. He managed to blink. Well, I'm going to have dogs and babies when I grow up. As many as I want. He flashed a hundred watt smile again. The race again. Bye. He's such a geek. Then he said with a shuddering disdain of older brother for younger. So he said. He pounded after Will turned briefly to run backward and flipped a wave towards the bill. Bye. Will's not really a geek. Seth told Spill. He's just a kid and he's got diarrhea of the mouth, but he's pretty cool. He's certainly friendly. She shifted her shoulder back, smiled at him. Do you mind if I walk the rest of the way with you? It's okay. I thought I heard you say something about a geography test. Yeah, we took one today. It was nothing. You like school? It's there. He jerked his shoulder. You gotta go? I I always enjoyed it. Learning new things. She laughed like, I suppose I was a geek. So <laughs> they his head and narrowed his eyes as he studied her face. A looker. Bill had called her. He remembered. Guess she was. She had nice eyes. The light caller. 
It was sharp contrast to the dark lashes. Her hair wasn't as dark as Anna's, not light like Grace's, nor light nor light like Grace's. It was really shiny, he noted, and the way she pulled it back all smooth and stuff left her face right out there. She might be cool to draw sometime. <laughs> you don't look like a geek. Said the house just as Seville felt. He began to rise in her cheeks under his long, intense study. Anyway, <sighs> that would be a nerd. Oh, she wasn't sure if she just qualified for nerd status and decided not to ask. What do you like studying best? I don't know. Mostly it was just a bunch of stuff. He decided quickly to center in his opinion. I guess I like it better when we get to read about people instead of things. I've always liked to study people. She stopped and gestured toward a small two-story gray house with a trim front yard. My theory would be that a young family lives there. Both husband and wife work outside the home, and they have a preschooler, most likely a boy. Odds are they've known each other a number of years and have been married less than seven. How come? Well, it's in the middle of the day and no one's home. No cars in the drive and the house looks empty, but there's a tricycle there and several large toy trucks. The house isn't new, but it's well kept. Most young couples both work today in order to buy a home, having a family. They live in a small community. The younger people rarely settle in small towns unless one or both of them grew up here. So I theorize that this couple lived here, knew each other, eventually married. It's likely they have their first child within the first three years of marriage and the toys indicate he's three to five. That's pretty cool. So that's decided after a moment. However foolish she was, she felt a search of pride that she might have avoided nerd dumb after all. But I'd want to know more, wouldn't you? But I'd want to know more, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? She caught his interest. Like what? Why did they choose this particular house? What are their goals? What is the status of their relationship? Who handles the money, which indicates the disposition of power, and why? If you study people, you see the patterns. How come it matters? I don't understand. Who cares? She considered. She considered. Well, if you understand the patterns, the, so, the social picture on a large scale, you learn why people behave in certain manners. What if they don't fit? Right, boy, she thought on another deeper wave of pride. Everyone fits some pattern. You factor in background, genetics, education, social strata, religious, and cultural roots. You get paid for that? Yes, I suppose I do. Weird. Now she concluded she had definitely been related to nerd status. <clears throat> it can be interesting. She racked her brain to come up with an example that was savage. Just pinning of it. I did this experiment once in several cities. I arranged for a man to stand on the street and stare up at a building. Just stare at it? That's right. He stood there and stared up, shading his eyes from the sun when he had to. For long, someone, someone stopped beside him and stared up at the same building, then another and another until there were a crowd of people, all looking up at the building. It took much longer for anyone to actually ask what was going on. What were they looking at? No one really wanted to be the first to ask because they, that was a mission that they, that you didn't see what you assumed everyone else was seeing. We want to conform, we want to fit in. We want to know and see and understand what the pe person beside us knows and sees and understands. I bet some of them thought someone was going to jump out of a window. Very likely, the average time an individual stood looking, interrupting their schedule was two minutes. She believed she caught his imagination again, so she hurried on. That's actually quite a long time to stare at a perfectly ordinary building. That's pretty cool, but it's still weird. <laughs> they were coming to the point where he would have to figure off. To go to the bully yard, she talked quickly, and a rare move went with impulse. What do you think would happen if you conducted that same experiment in St. Christopher's? I don't know. Same thing? I doubt it. She sent him a conspirator's smile. Want to try it? Maybe. We can head over to the waterfront now. Will your brother worry if you're a few minutes later? Should you go tell him you're with me? Nah, Cam doesn't keep me on a leash. Cuts me some slack sometime. She wasn't sure how she felt about the loose discipline in that area, but the moment she was happy to take advantage of it. Let's try it then. I'll pay you an ice cream. You got a deal. They turned away from the boatyard. You can pick a spot. She began, it's necessary to stand. People don't generally pay attention to someone who's sitting and looking. They often assume the person is simply daydreaming or resting. I get it. It's more effective if you look up at something. Is it okay if I videotape? He'd raise his eyebrows, and she took a date, neat, compact video recorder out of the bag. Yeah, I guess. You carry that around all the time. When I'm working, I do. In a notebook, in a micro-auto tape recorder, backup batteries, tapes, extra pencils, my cell phone. She laughed to herself. I like being prepared. And the day they make a computer small enough to fit it in my purse, I'm going to be the first in line. Phil likes all that electronic stuff, too. 
the back here, the baggage of the urbanite. We're desperate not to waste a minute. Then, of course, we can't get away from anything because we're plugged in every second of the day. You could just turn everything off. Yes, oddly she found that simplicity of a statement profound. I suppose I could. Protesting in traffic was light on the waterfront. She saw a work boat unloading today's catch and a family taking advantage of the balmy afternoon by splurging on ice cream sundaes at one of the little outdoor tables. Two old men, their faces not brown and deeply seamed, sat on the iron bench with a checkerboard between them. Neither seemed inclined to make a move. Three of women chatted in the doorway of one of the shops, but only one of them carried a bag. I'm going to stand over there, says Pointed Spot, and look up at the hotel. Good choice. Sapphire stayed where she was as she strolled off. As he strolled off, distance was necessary to keep the experiment pure. She lifted the camera, zoomed in as Seth moved away, turned once, shot her quick cocky smile, and when his face filled her view screen, Emotion she hadn't been prepared for flooded her. He was so handsome, so bright, so happy. She struggled to pull herself back from a dangerous edge that she was afraid was despair. She could walk away. She thought, pack up and leave, never see him again. He would never know who she was or what they were to each other. He would never miss whatever she could bring into his life. She was nothing to him. She never really tried to be. It was different now, she reminded herself. She was making it different now, deliberately. She ordered her fingers relaxed, her neck, her arms. She was causing no harm, but getting to know him, spending some time studying his situation. She taped him as he settled on a spot, lifted his face. His profile was finer, more angled than glorious. The build decided perhaps his bone structure had come from his father. His build wasn't glorious either, as she'd first assumed, but more like her own and her mother's. He would be tall when he finished growing, mostly leg and on the slim side. His body language, she saw... With a slight joke, was typical Quinn. Already, he'd taken on some of the traits of his foster family. That hip shot, stance, hands tucked in pockets, head angled. She fell back in a noise, spurt of resentment, and ordered herself to focus on the experiment. It took just over a minute for the first person to stop beside Seth to recognize the big woman with the gray streaked hair who manned the counter at Crawford's. Everyone called her mother. As expected, the woman shifted her gaze, tilted her face up to fall Seth's side aside. But after a quick scan, she patted Seth on the shoulder. What are you looking at, boy? Nothing, he muttered. It so that Seville edged closer to try to pick up his voice on the thing. Well, you stand there for a long looking, looking at nothing. People are going to think you're pixelated. Why aren't you down to the boatyard? I'm going in a minute. Hey, mother. Hey, Seth. Pretty young woman with dark hair. Steps into the frame. Lands up at the hotel. Something's going on up here. I don't see anything. Nothing to see, mother informed. Boy's just standing looking at nothing. How's your mama, Julie? Oh, she's a little under weather. She's got a sore throat and a little cough. Chicken soup, pot, tea, and honey. Grace bought some soup over this morning. You see, she eats it. Hey there, Jim. Half afternoon. Short stocky man in white rubber boots. Clamped over, gave such a friendly splat on the head. What are you staring up at there, boy? Jeez, can a guy just stand around? Seth turned his face to the camera. Rolled his eyes for a little. Made her chuckle. Stand your long goals light on you, Jim winked at him. Captain in for the day, he had to refer to Ethan. He gets to the boatyard before you, he's going to want to know why. I'm going, I'm going, man. Shoulders around and head down, says, stop back to the middle. Nobody's falling for it. Because everybody knows you. She switched off the camera, Lord. It changes the pattern. You figured that it would happen? I theorized, she corrected, that in a closely knit area where the subject was known, the pattern would be that an individual would stop. They would probably look first in question. There's no risk, no lose of loss of ego when questioning a familiar person and a young one at that. Round over toward where the trio continued at. So, uh, I still get paid? Absolutely, and you'll likely write a section in my book. Cool. I'll take a cookie dough cone. I've got to get to the boatyard before Cam and Ethan house me. If they're going to be angry with you, I'll explain. It's my fault you're late. They won't be pissed or anything. Besides, I'll tell them it was, like, for science, right? When he flushed that grin, she had to resist an unexpected urge to hug him. That's exactly right. Trish laid a hand on his shoulder as they started toward Crawford. She thought she felt him stiffen and casually let her hand drop away. And then, and we can always call them on my cell phone. Yeah? Way cool. Can I do it? <laughs> Sure, why not? Twenty minutes later, Sabil was at her desk, fingers racing over a keyboard. Though I spent less than an hour with him, I would conclude that the subject is extremely bright. Philip informed me that he achieves high grades academically, which is admirable. It was satisfying to discover that he has questioning mind. His manners are perhaps a bit rough, but not unpleasant. He appears to be considerably more outgoing socially than his mother or I were at his age. And that, I mean, he seems quite natural with relative strangers without the polite formality that was stressed in my 
my upbringing. Part of this may be due to the influence of the Quince. They are, as I have noted previously, informal, casual people. I would also conclude from watching both the children and the adults who, who interacted today that he is generally well-liked in this community and accepted as part of it. Naturally, I cannot, at this early stage, conclude whether or not his best interest would be served by remaining here. It's simply not possible to ignore Gloria's rights nor have attempted nor have attempted as yet to discover the boy's wishes as concerned his mother. Wanted, I would prefer that he grow accustomed to me, feel comfortable around me before he learns of our family connection. I need more time to. She broke off as the phone rang. It's getting her easily typed notes. Picked up from Dr. Griffin. Hello, Dr. Griffin. Why do I expect I've interrupted your work? She recognized Phil's voice, the amazement, amusement in it, and with a flare of guilt, lowered the top of her computer. Because you're a perceptive man, but I can spare a few minutes. How things in Baltimore? Busy. How's this? The visual is a handsome young couple, beaming smiles as they carry their laughing toddler to a mid-sized sedan. Caption, Mind stone tires. Your family matters to us. Manipulative. The customer is led to believe that if he or she buys another brand, the family doesn't matter to that other company. Yeah, it works, of course. We're hitting the car mags with a different image. Screaming convertible and kick-ass red long winding road. Sexy blonde at the wheel. Miss Mirestone tires. You can drive there, or you can be there. Clever. <laughs> the client likes it, and that takes a load off. How's life in St. Chris? Quiet. I ran into Seth a bit. Actually, I drafted him to help me with an experiment. It went well. Oh, yeah? How much did you have to pay him? An ice cream cone, double scoop. <laughs> he got off cheap. The kid's an operator. How about dinner tomorrow night? A bottle of champagne to celebrate our mutual successes. Speaking of operators... I've been thinking about you all week. Three days? He corrected and picking up a pencil to get a doodle on her pad. And nights, with this account settled, I can get out a little earlier tomorrow. Why well, don't I want to pick you up at seven? I'm not sure where we're going, Philip. Neither am I. Do, we, do you need to be? She understood that neither of them was speaking of restaurants. It's less confusing that way. Then we'll talk about it, and maybe we'll get past the confusion. Seven o'clock? She glanced down, noticed that she unconsciously sketched his face on her notepad. Bad sign. She thought a very dangerous sign. All right. It was the best... It was best to face compensation said on. I'll see you tomorrow. Do me a favor. If I can. Think of me tonight. She doubted she had any choice in the matter. Bye. In his office, 14 stories above the streets of Baltimore, Philip pushed back from his slick black desk. Ignoring the beep on his computer that signaled an inner office email and turned toward his wide window. He loved this, his view of the city, the renovated buildings, the glimpses of the harbor, the hustle of cars and people below. But just now, he didn't see any of it. He literally couldn't get the bill out of his mind. It was a new experience for him. This congenial tug on his thoughts and concentration. It wasn't as if she was in fear Fearing with his routine, he reflected. He could work, eat, brainstorm, do his presentations as skillfully as he had before he met her. But she was simply there, he decided, a trickle at the back of his mind. Though the day through the day that inched forward to the front when his injuries were otherwise occupied. He wasn't quite sure if he enjoyed having a woman demand so much of his attention, particularly a woman who was doing very little to encourage him. Maybe he considered that light sheen of formality, that cautious distance she tried to maintain a challenge. He thought he could live with that <sighs> he was just another of the entertaining and varied games men and women played but he worried that something was happening on a level he never explored and if he was any judge she was just as unsettled by it as he was it's just like you Ray said from behind oh jesus philip didn't spin around didn't google he simply shut his eyes pretty fancy office got here been a while since i got in Ray proud of the room. Casually, pursuers person who lives had a black frame canvas flashed with red and blues. Not bad, he decided. Rain stimulator. I guess that's why you put it in your office to get the juices going. I refuse to believe that my dead father is standing in my office for taking art. <laughs> well, that wasn't what I wanted to talk about anyway. But he paused by a middle sculpture in the corner. But I like this piece too. You always had high class taste. Art, food, women. He grinned cheerfully and Philip turned. The woman you've got on your mind now, for instance. Very high class. I need to take some time off. <laughs> I'd agree with you there. You've been up to, up to and over your head for months. She's an interesting woman, Philip. There's more to her than you see. 
more than she knows. I hope, I hope when the time comes, you listen to her. Really listen to her. What are you talking about? He held up a hand upon my Why am I asking you what you're talking about when you're not here? I'm hoping that the pair of you will stop analyzing the steps and stages and accept what is. Ray Shark slipped his hands into the pockets of his Oreos filter jacket. But you have to go your own way. It's going to be hard. There's not much time left before it gets a lot harder. You'll stand between Seth and what hurts him. I know that. I want to tell you that you can trust her. When it's down to the sticking point, Philip. You can trust yourself, and you can trust her. New chills get down. What does the bill have to do with Seth? It's not for me to tell you that. He smiled again, but his eyes didn't match the cover of his lip. You haven't talked to your brothers about me. You need to. You need to stop feeling. You have to control all the buttons. You're good at it. God knows. But give a little. You're doing a deep breath. Turn this proposal. Christ. Your mother. You drew a deep breath in his lungs. Christ, your mother would have gotten a kick out of this place. You've done a hell of a job in your life so far. Now his eyes. I'm proud of you. I know you'll handle what comes next. You did a hell of a job with my life, he learned. You win, Mom. Damn right we did. Ray went, keep it up. When the phone rang, Ray said, everything that happens needs to happen. It's what you do about it that makes the difference. Answer the phone, Philip. Remember, Seth needs you. Then there was nothing but the ringing of the phone in an empty office. With his gaze locked on where his father had pen, Philip reached for the phone. Philip coined as he listened. His eyes hardened. He grabbed a pen and began to take notes on the detective's report on the most recent movements of Gloria DeLotner. End of chapter 8.